There's a reason that VH1's I Love the 90s series features regular appearances by the Snapple Lady, a.k.a. Wendy Kaufman. I'm sick at the thought of going back to those receipts. Kaufman's portrayal of the beverage brand's blue-collar receptionist was iconic. Hello from Snapple. Today's letter is from Nancy Lambert. Her dog Shane can be asleep in the back bedroom, but if you open a Snapple, she comes running. And in the span of half a decade, the small-time Long Island juice operation and its slogan Made from the best stuff on earth became a sort of cultural touchstone. New Yorkers love it. You're gonna love it too. Snapple, made from the best stuff on earth. But what a lot of folks don't realize is that that iconic slogan almost wound up in the dustbin of history, and marketer Jane Cavalier's pitch was originally spurned by the company's owners for being too blue collar. They said, you know, we like this, we really like this work, but uh, you know that tagline is terrible. And then after Snapple's meteoric rise, fueled by the pre-viral era success of Richard Kirschenbaum's Snapple Lady ad campaign, the brand would hemorrhage hundreds of millions of dollars in value when new owners would again try to hide from Snapple's blue-collar roots. If you're going to purchase a brand or if you're going to create a brand, authenticity and integrity is everything. I'm Dusty Weiss. From Podcamp Media, this is Lead Balloon a podcast about PR, marketing, and branding disasters and the well-meaning communications professionals who lived them. Thanks for tuning in. Please make sure you're following or subscribing to this podcast in your favorite app and check out PodCamp Media on every social platform that exists. Just all of them. Find us. Follow us. We're out there. Snapple's early 90s advertising was on point. I was seven or eight at the time that these ads were airing, and it's actually some of the first advertising that I remember really resonating with me. I don't know what that says about me, but it was big. It was fun. It was authentic. It was not pretentious, and it wasn't afraid to laugh at itself. That's why it succeeded, and ultimately, the turn away from that approach contributed to Snapple's epic downfall. And so today we're talking to two brand strategists who had hands in shaping that success. And the first of these is Jane Cavalier, who joins us now. Jane is the founder and CEO of Brightmark Consulting in Westport, Connecticut. She's a former Madison Avenue marketer who previously drove strategic planning as an executive vice president at McCann Erickson, one of the world's largest advertising agencies. And these days, on top of her work at Brightmark, she's also the author of The Enchanted Brand, strengthening the human side of business in the age of new essentialism. So, Jane Cavalier, thank you for joining us on the Lead Balloon Podcast. Oh, thanks, Dusty. I'm so happy to be here. So, Jane, can you tell me briefly about your background? You have had a very rich and storied career in the field of advertising. What path has that career taken, and what are some of the brands that you've had a hand in shaping? Well, you know, it's interesting, Dusty. I think I probably started at the end of the Mad Men era on Madison Avenue. I started at a, at that time, was a great creative agency called Doyle Dane Burnback, which really had transformed Madison Avenue by pairing the copywriter with the art director and creating that team for the first time. So I worked in large agencies. And then I went uh, with two partners from a place called Shy Day. We formed a creative boutique, which in its first year won more creative awards in advertising than any other agency in its history. And then I returned back to a large agency, as you mentioned, at McCann Erickson, where I was EVP of strategic planning. And I fell in love with branding and brand strategy there. And I opened up the first brand strategy boutique for McCann. And then left with uh, ExxonMobil as a founding partner client worldwide and had my own brand consulting company with ex-chairman of McCann, Peter Kim. It was called Bright Sun. And then from there, I moved into my own brand consulting company called Brightmark. You know, I've been doing that for the last 20 years. One of the things that I love about talking to Jane for this episode is that she brings a perspective of having worked with all of these huge brands in both the big agency world and the boutique agency world. But of course, the brand that we're discussing today is Snapple. The company was founded 50 years ago on Long Island by a trio of blue-collar fellas whose approach to juice making was as unsophisticated as their approach to marketing. And I'm not talking down here. I'm just saying that the brand was originally launched under the moniker Unadulterated Food Products, which not only violates the yummy buffet axiom, which we discussed in the last episode of the show, but it doesn't exactly make me want to run out and crack open a bottle. You know, and the three owners, Lenny, Jaime, and Arnie, 
Lenny and Jaime were brother-in-laws. Arnie is the one who owned the natural health food store. The other two were in the window washing business. So um, I would say that like a lot of entrepreneurs, they intuitively think they know branding or they know marketing. And then as they get into it, it's not as easy as they thought. By the way, even when I was working with them, the official name of the company, the name on the check that my agency received was the Unadulterated Beverage Company. But they did know enough not to call the product that, they called the product Snapple. How did that name come about? Honestly, it's so funny because they were just sitting around and uh, Arnie said, you know, it's like snappy, snappy. I think that's literally how they did. They were snapping their fingers. They thought it was a cute name. And they said, let's call it Snapple. We never heard of that before. And these were colorful fellas too, but it's interesting to me because health food is almost a $1 trillion industry in today's world. And that's driven largely by marketing and consumer demand. But back in the 80s, that wasn't necessarily the case. Yeah, I mean, it was getting its roots in the 80s. I think the early adopters were getting into it. But the problem was that the products weren't there. People wanted them, but if something was healthy, it tasted terrible. They were diametrically opposed. So the minute you heard that this was a healthy food, you expected the taste to pretty much be unacceptable. So there was a dichotomy that was settling in, in, in at least in people's minds, between taste and healthy. That you don't have today because you know, healthy foods actually do what we said Snapple did, was they actually taste better. So up to the point where you got involved with the company, what had the management of Snapple done to market itself and grow the business? Well, what's really interesting is they focused on the natural juice products, 100% juices, you know, and they were small, like six ounce. And juice is not even today really considered a mainstream beverage. It's not like we go and crack open a, you know, some apple juice when we're getting together socially or, you know, pineapple juice. But they were focused on, because the juices were the healthiest products, they were focusing on the healthiest product. They were trying to get that mainstream and they were doing a lot of tactical things just by, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs make this mistake, pounding their chest, saying we're great. They actually took a big beverage truck and they parked it in front of the Coca-Cola headquarters and it said Snapple, the realer thing. And they were very disappointed that that didn't get some giant amount of press and sort of put them on the map. So by the time I met them, they really had been at it for about 10 years and struggling with, you know, they felt they had the right product. They felt they were in the right places and they had the right packaging and pricing and they'd been trying lots of marketing tactics, but it still was not a mainstream beverage. So your involvement with Snapple Brands started right around 1990, 1991, right after you and two partners founded the boutique agency Buckley, DeSerchio and Cavalier. How did that conversation begin with the Snapple company? Well, let me tell you the first thing is that we reached out to them. They weren't looking for us. We were looking for them. We reached out to them. And I kid you not, I wrote them a three page letter telling them how interested we were in their company and how very much we would like to work with them. And they got back to us and said, we never heard anyone get so excited about our business, more excited than we are about our business. Why don't you come in and talk to us? That's actually how we got the meeting. And then when we got to the meeting, the letter, which was a paper letter, because back then what we like to do as an agency is we like to send out things, tactile things that people can hold on to. The letter was there and I loved it because it had like, hamburger grease stains on the letter. <laughs> like Clearly they were eating with the letter <laughs> and they had it there. And so what they were looking for, I think, and willing to take a meeting with us was, was it possible that these people could have a solution to getting us mainstream that we haven't explored it? Oh, by the way, we hardly have any money. I mean, relative to a Coke and a Pepsi, they had a total media budget of a million dollars, which was fractional. They were, again, mostly a local company, as I understand it to this point. They had distribution kind of throughout the New York area, but they hadn't really taken off as a regional or a national thing yet. They hadn't, no. And it was interesting. They had a, their distribution strategy, which also was very novel, I think, was a focus on single serve, 100% glass. That's not easy in beverage. Nobody wanted glass, but people told them, and they had the wide mouth bottle, which is an innovation in packaging. These were all ideas as entrepreneurs and how entrepreneurs are. This is who we are. This is the way we want to do it. And they had many uh, places that wouldn't accept them because the product was in glass. And Lenny, who was in charge of the product taste, said, you know, the purest taste comes with glass. We have to stay with glass. We don't care. 
Lenny, Jaime, and Arnie were ahead of their time in a lot of these tactics. The choice of glass over plastic, the wide-mouthed bottles. But like a lot of small business owners, they had fixated on one facet of the operation, the all-natural, health-first fruit juices, to the detriment of their grasp on the bigger picture. And during the discovery phase of Jane's work for Snapple, they uncovered some revelations in a meeting at Snapple HQ that would change the course of the company forever. They had all their juice products out. We're tasting the juice products to see, you know, which ones we like. We're looking at the packaging. And I kid you not, in the corner stacked was a case of a different product. And we're like, well, what's that? And he said, Lenny made some of these iced teas. We think that tastes pretty good, but nobody drinks iced tea. No one's going to want iced tea. And we said, well, can we try one of those? Which one does Lenny like the best? And they said, well, Lenny likes the peach. It's okay, well, bring out the peach iced tea. So we pull it up, and it's also bigger, much bigger than the juices, right? The juices are six ounces, so it's bigger. We sip it, and we go, oh my God, this is the best tasting beverage we've ever had. I'll be honest, I had a pretty serious Snapple lemon iced tea addiction from about year 2000 to 2005 or so, right in there, before I finally kicked it. So I empathize with that. Yeah, that was a big moment for us because we knew that what we needed to do was just get people to try the product product one time and it would sell itself. So every time you're working on a brand or marketing, there's all different things about, you know, what do we have to do? But we knew all we had to do is drive people to take one sip and that would be it. Challenge number one is we had had to get Lenny, Jaime and Arnie to agree to put the juices aside and to focus on the iced tea. Why was that a problem? I mean, the only iced teas in the market were terrible Lipton and Nest tea products in cans and nobody was buying them and the taste was awful. So they were very skeptical, you know, in their minds, like a lot of entrepreneurs were all about the juices. This is the healthiest product. And we're like, you know, juices are not really going to catch on. They're not as thirst quenching. There's much more product in this. And this is by far uh, a revolutionary tasting beverage. So the first thing is they were willing to give us the leap of faith to focus on the iced teas. I'll tell you another really interesting thing. When they had the original label for the peach iced tea, it was like typical Snapple guys, Boston Tea Party, you know, 17, 76 kind of boat on there. And literally the word Bettman Archive, the stock photo company's name was on the label because they thought it was a good deal that they were getting that image for free. Oh my gosh. All right. All right. So they've got the product. Now you've convinced them to move forward with these teas, but now the ask is still one of going mainstream, getting people's attention. We have to get Coke and Pepsi to blink. And what's the first thing we know? There's two things we know. One, it's all about taste. Beverage is all about taste. One of the problems that they were making, they're putting way too much focus on natural, 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 not realizing that in those days when you said natural, it means, oh, this doesn't taste good. It was a black mark. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It was basically underselling themselves by focusing too much on that. So job number one is, and they got it right away, that They had to focus on taste and they did believe they had taste superiority with the peach iced tea. And so we thought, okay, we're going to focus on taste, but we're not going to throw away natural. We're going to use it as a reason why this tastes great. And so we want to go out with a strategy of taste superiority. Now, again, this is not like Procter & Gamble, superior taste. That's not the way beverages work. But we knew that we wanted to get people to believe that this might be an amazing tasting product. And the reason why was because it was made with all natural ingredients. Second part of it was our commitment then with the brand to use wit and humor because we knew that we had to get people to smile. I mean, Coke and Pepsi, like these people locked up, like never would change. And people had patterns where, you know, I get my sandwich and I get my Coke. I get my sandwich and my Coke. And it's like, how are we going to break that pattern? So a commitment to using humor, which lets people, you know, let down their guards, smile and go, oh, maybe I'll give that a try. So armed with their new knowledge of Snapple's product line and a better appreciation of her client's blue collar sense of humor, Jane and her colleagues set to work trying to craft a catchphrase for the brand. But Jane says she doesn't really remember any of the other options they considered. Because once they spitballed this iconic slogan, made from the best stuff on earth, they knew they had a timeless classic. It was just like, that's a good line. That's a really good line. Let's bring that to them. So we, you know, we just didn't bring the line by itself. We brought campaigns. We thought, you know, TV essential, particularly in beverage. It means you're real. 
So that was also, they've never done television before. We had to convince them, you know, we'll find an affordable way to do it. Super funny commercials, they're like laughing. And then they saw the line made from the best stuff on earth. And they kind of looked at it and they said, you know, we like this, we really like this work, but uh, you know, that tagline's terrible. I was like, what do you mean? It works, like made from the best stuff on earth. It suggests really great taste because it's made from the greatest things without having to say great taste. I mean, it lets people come to the decision in their own mind. No, stuff. Lenny, who says stuff in their tagline? Nobody says the word stuff in their tagline. You think we're stupid? You think we're going to use the word stuff? We're not going to use stuff. We hadn't thought about them being offended by using the word stuff. I mean, you know, obviously you never fall in love with a pitch as a marketer, but still it has to be disheartening in that moment. And remember the decibel level is like yelling, like very high. Listen, we were very confident in the work. I mean, we we knew it was a great line. All of us had been in advertising a long time and you have good lines, you have okay, but we knew this was a great line. And so it was disheartening, but these guys were also the kind of guys like, how many times did you say the word Snapple? I only counted three. Can you add five? I mean, they were all over in terms of us having to deal and help them understand the creative decisions that were being made. So we just, we didn't say much. We just listened. We didn't fight. We didn't argue. We just said, okay, we're hearing what you're saying. Can you come up with some other lines? And we said, we don't know. We think this one's pretty good, but, and so we just let it sit for a little while. And we, over time, had conversations with them. We didn't try to make some big push and point to other taglines. We felt that they would get comfortable with it over time. And they did. It took three months. So what does that tell you? Sometimes you have to have patience. And we went ahead. We were still working on the TV campaign. We were working on the outdoor campaigns. We wanted to make the product the star. It was the T's focused in the New York market. New York is a great media city. And our strategy was, you know, local TV, the bigness of TV. We had a couple of commercials, buses and kiosks, because the outdoor really gets New Yorkers talking. So we're getting our sample into the culture, right? We're getting into the culture with the outdoor. We're getting into the culture with television. We're getting the, the radio DJ. Hey, it's time to talk about Snapple. Let me tell you something. I love Snapple more than anything, ladies. I really do. Anything? Even more than, yes, anything. <laughs> and they loved Howard Stern. They were using Stern. He wasn't really pumped about the juices. So now we had the iced teas. He and Robin loved the iced teas. And we made sure that we're on three days a week, not one day a week. Because when you're on three days a week, it sounds like you're on five days a week. But you're really on three. Snapple also makes all natural juices, drinks, real brewed iced teas, seltzers. And Snap Up, the first all natural sports drink. So those Snapple. media tactics were great. So as we're going on and getting the work done, they started to warm up to the line. We didn't hard sell it. We just spoke to them. We kept it in. We didn't come back with alternative lines. We said we didn't think we had any that would work, but we were, we said, we're still thinking about it. And then we knew. And then over time, it's like three months, they came back and they said, you know, you're right. We love this line. And stuff is a great word because it's a real world. That's the way people talk. That's the way we talk. Snapple's a real product, right? They saw the wisdom in it. Yeah. And it's funny because to me, it harkens back. I spent some time working at Milwaukee City Hall in a public relations role, and I was representing 15 different members of the Milwaukee City Council. And I could always tell who was going to give me pushback because it's always been my practice that you want to talk like people talk, whether you're doing a news release, whether you're doing a podcast or a radio broadcast or something like that. You want to talk like people talk. And I would always get the most pushback from the people who were most insecure about their own level of sophistication. And so we talked before about how this was sort of an unsophisticated group here, obviously good at their jobs, but not Madison Avenue. Do you think that was part of the pushback that they had against this? Was this sort of insecurity in, oh, we don't want to be seen as rubes? Yeah, I mean, I think you're spot on with that. Even though these were very humble and self-effacing guys, literally, they would always start a meeting with, we don't know nothing about the beverage business. Like, those were the words. We don't know nothing. Okay, so, and they love to put that out there because they liked people to think that they really didn't know anything when they actually knew quite a bit. But I do think that they were worried that their window washer roots and that they weren't as sophisticated as the companies that they were going up against. Maybe they thought this was just, yeah, a reflection on that. 
So, with the new slogan firmly affixed to every ad and every glass bottle of Snapple, Jane and her partners continued the New York-centric ad blitz and started testing the waters in the national market. And the product's sales immediately started going up. And it started catching on because people, what? They were drinking the iced tea and exactly what I told you. Oh my God, I love this. Joe, you have to buy this. So literally like sales were going like crazy, like just unbelievable. It's like what everybody dreams about as an entrepreneur. And then Stern was also drinking it on the show. Going, this is the best tasted thing I ever had. Why? Because it's made from the best stuff on earth. Made from the best stuff on earth. That's got to feel good as a marketer hearing your line come out of the mouth of somebody like Howard Stern. Yeah, it feels really good. You know, sometimes when I see my partners, you know, we talk about, oh my God, the line is still around. It's one of the longest lasting taglines ever. Imagine if we'd gotten a penny for every time that line had been used. Right, right. No, more than 30 years that slogan has been going strong, and this might squick you out a little bit when I say it out loud, but Jane, I've grown up, I'm a 37-year-old man, I've never known a world in which Snapple was not made from the best stuff on earth. Like, that tagline has been around as long as I have memories. (laughs) So, why do you think that slogan has just resonated and stuck so long? It's sort of like even like a piece of poetry too, right? I think there's a lot of parts to it. I think there's a cadence to the way the words roll. I think best stuff on earth is a cool notion. Just the word earth, you know, it sounds better than saying it's the best in the world. That's kind of cliche and flat. So I think there's some magic literally in the words. And I like the made. It's a very proactive and it's not braggy or boastful, but it has a lot of positive swagger to it, if you will. But, like her agency, Buckley, DiCercio, and Cavalier, Jane's time with the Snapple brand was sunsetting, paving the way for a new creative force in Snapple's brand history. It ended up winding down because you know, we ended up closing the agency partially because my two partners wrote a screenplay and went to Hollywood. And we decided we didn't want to try to do the agency while pursuing Hollywood dreams. So that's why we passed it on then to Kirschenbaum and Bond. We wanted to pass it on to one of our brethren who we thought would continue in the vein with the witty, humorous ads and keeping the brand alive in the line. And Kirschenbaum took that over and introduced the Wendy Coffin campaign. And so coming up after the break, Richard Kirschenbaum, Jane Cavalier's creative brethren himself, joins us to discuss the rise and fall of the Snapple Lady campaign he orchestrated and the corporate mismanagement that would result in hundreds of millions of dollars in deflated brand value for Snapple. He started at one point, I think, calling the brand Crapple. And that was really when it went from this is a brand I love to this is a brand I don't like anymore. That's coming up in a minute here on Lead Balloon. You know, we're coming up on 50 episodes of Lead Balloon, and it has been a real treat to get to tell these stories. But podcasting could sometimes be a lot like yelling out into the void. If I don't get any feedback, I don't know if what I'm doing is working for you. Sure, we've won some awards, and I can see that our listenership has grown over the years. But I don't know what you find valuable about this show. I don't know if I should be doing longer or shorter episodes, more or fewer fun topics, serious topics... And so as we're winding down the fourth season of Lead Balloon, I'm looking ahead to next year, and it would be really valuable to me if you could take a quick survey to help me make this show better for you. Two minutes of your time is all I'm asking. Visit podcampmedia.com slash survey, and I'll drop a link to that in the episode description as well. That's podcampmedia.com slash survey. And speed of milestones, hey, here at PodCamp Media, we recently published our 250th branded podcast episode on behalf of clients. If you want to learn more about launching a podcast for your brand, visit PodCampMedia.com. Let's get a meeting on the calendar. This is Lead Balloon, and I'm Dusty Weiss. It was the early 90s, and the Snapple brand was on the rise. Coke and Pepsi's stranglehold had finally slipped, Snapple bottles were flying out of deli coolers, and Howard Stern was feeding Snapple to monkeys while comedian Sam Kinison and exercise guru Richard Simmons cackled in the corner. Ah! The monkey loves it! What an endorsement! I mean, it was going to be that clip, or the one where Stern drinks Snapple out of a bikini model's belly button. But whether it was wise marketing by today's standards is irrelevant. Because 30 years ago, Howard Stern had tremendous influence and Snapple was going gangbusters. 
thanks in no small part to its new slogan, made from the best stuff on earth. The tagline is memorable, it's snappy, it's imbued with a great message, and I think that it was able to deliver on a promise. Richard Kirschenbaum was the co-founder of Kirschenbaum and Bond, the agency that landed Snapple's advertising account after Jane Cavalier and her partners shuttered their operation. Founded in 1987, Kirschenbaum and Bond would grow to become the largest independent advertising agency in the U.S. when Richard sold it years later, serving clients including BMW, Hennessy, and Coach. These days, Richard is the CEO and founder of SWAT by Kirschenbaum and SWAT Equity. He's lectured at the Harvard Business School, was inducted into the Advertising Hall of Fame in the year 2000, he's written a handful of books, and was voted one of the 25 most stylish New Yorkers by Us Weekly. That's a heck of a resume right there. But Richard says when his agency signed Snapple as a client, the brand was already primed with that memorable slogan. And all it needed now was a memorable spokesperson. I mean, our agency has always been noted for either coming up with great lines or actually even bringing them back. I mean, you know, when we were handling BMW, we actually brought back for some marketing the ultimate driving machine at the time. You know, there there are times where you just have to respect the integrity of what a brand has done and that there are some iconic aspects to to branding. And I think what was even more interesting is that Wendy the Snapple Lady even became more iconic than anything. And I'm still you know, maintains a great level of memorability years after the campaign has run. So when your engagement with the brand began, what, in your opinion, did the brand need from an ad campaign to grow and mature as a brand? And, and what was your team's process for approaching the problem there? And, and then certainly the discovery of Wendy Kaufman, the Snapple lady, that became a part of that process as well. But how did your involvement with the brand begin and, and where did you take it? Well, I think um, at the time, our agency was one of the first planning agencies in the US and planning is really about strategy. So we always look to find uh, a unique strategy from the brand and you use the word discovery. That's what we did. So there's a discovery process. We went out to uh, the facility um, in Valley Stream to look at where the brand was made. We got to know the founders. We started to do consumer research. We, we did some competitive research, obviously. But as we started to really understand more about the brand, we started to discover some really unusual things. And that were that consumers were really passionate about the brand, but they were very protective of the brand. And so one day, um, members of our team were out in Valley Stream and they came across a box of letters. And when we started to read the consumer letters, we were really shocked by how passionate they were. You know, there were people that, you know, tattooed Snapple onto their body, named their son's middle name Snapple, um, you know, stuff that we hadn't seen before. But what was really interesting was that the person who was answering those letters was Wendy Kaufman, who is still, in my opinion, one of the funniest, warmest people I know. I adore her. Hi from Snapple. Today I got a letter from a young guy who writes, I love your all natural beverages. Do you allow people to tour your plant? Okay. And uh, she was working there in consumer relations in the office. The apocryphal story goes that Wendy Kaufman took a paper pushing job at Snapple's Long Island headquarters after she was fired from her job as a truck dispatcher. In an appearance on Oprah Winfrey's TV network, she says she quickly found ways to take initiative. I went to Snapple. I was not there for a very long time when I realized that people were writing these extraordinary love letters to Snapple. And I took all the letters that nobody else wanted to handle and really started to handle the public relations. And when we started to really formulate the campaign and come up with the strategy, the strategy ended up being 100% natural advertising. It was one of the first campaigns that were really about authenticity. Snapple wanted to really make it into a national brand. So what happened was my boss told the ad agency, this girl is crazy. You just got to watch what she's doing with these letters. In fact, I remember having the discussion when I pitched the idea of Wendy to the founders. I think they were somewhat perplexed as to why we would want to use Wendy. They thought, you know, we were thinking of someone like Pamela Anderson. Like, you know, (laughs) I mean, they were sort of steeped in the traditional, you know, idea of beauty and healthfulness. And, and, you know, Wendy, who herself 
has always joked about, you know, being somewhat heavyset, although she looks great now. And it was definitely controversial. There were fights in the main office. How are you going to take the fat girl from the order department and put her on national TV? I mean, it was just an unusual choice. And I remember saying, but she's the real person. And so at the time, and this was what was great about the founders. I remember the conversation I had with Arnie Greenberg. And he said to me, you know what, Richard, we hired you guys because we think you guys are the best. And we want to, someone to take risks. And he said, you know, if the, you really believe in this, he said, we are not as comfortable as you are, but, you know, we'll let you do it. But if it doesn't work, well, you know, obviously you'll get fired. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, of course, that's the way it should work. You know, those are the kind of decisions that I thought were really important for the brand and that we made and that really stood out. And I think consumers really hadn't seen anything like that. And they certainly hadn't seen anyone look or talk or act like Wendy. So in that vein of all natural advertising, Richard's team conceived of an ad campaign that put Wendy Kaufman front and center as the Snapple lady. If you're about 35 or older, you will undoubtedly remember these delightfully quirky lo-fi spots. In each, Wendy opens by reading a real letter, painstakingly curated by the team at Kirschenbaum and Bond, of course, from the Snapple mailbag. Hello from Snapple. Today's letter is from Nancy Lambert. Her dog Shane can be asleep in the back bedroom, but if you open a Snapple, she comes running. This, I gotta see. So the crew, we all went out there to wherever she lived in the Midwest, and, you know, she sat there, and we were filming, and it was documentary style. We actually hired a documentarian to shoot the campaign. Shaney, would you like some Snapple? She opened the thing. Shane, look at Snapple. You decided you want to sleep while everybody's watching you. Shane didn't come running. Shane just sat there. Pink lemonade. Made from the best stuff on earth. Forget it. You know, we had gone all this way to see Shane come running when he, they opened a Snapple cap. And Shane was, as we like to say in New York, laying there like a lox, you know? So, <laughs> But we loved the humor in it. And we ran the commercial with Shane not Running. See, and that's what I think is brilliant about it, because when someone is appointed as the director of a commercial like that, they're sent out into the field on an assignment like that, and they're told, bring us back video of this dog that comes running when you pop the cap. And a lot of directors, a lot of creatives put in that position will essentially try to over direct the spot. You gave your people the creative freedom to come back with something that was completely not what you expected, and you ran with it. And I think that that sort of authenticity resonated with people. Well, it certainly did. And I think that's where, you know, executive creative direction really comes into play. I mean, I think that we were always, we wanted to be authentic and truthful to the brand. We wanted to be 100% natural. So if the person answering the letters was Wendy, then she was the one reading the letters on TV and setting up the commercial. Snapple, made from the best stuff on earth. And as dozens of Snapple ads poured out over the airwaves, America's love affair with the Snapple lady really started to heat up. From 1992 to 1994, as the spots aired, Snapple's sales jumped by about 300%. The company was moving $500 million worth of product annually. And for company founders Lenny, Jaime, and Arnie, Wendy Kaufman's iconic chuckle (laughs) was music to their ears. What was amazing was... um, It was sort of one big happy family and Wendy was part of the family and we were part of the family. And it was a really wonderful time in the agency's life and and, and the brand and we were growing and we had this huge success on our hands and it was wonderful. But Richard says that doesn't mean they relaxed in their attentive defense of the brand that they had built. You know, when they looked at the work, I remember once seeing and they were sitting there and they were going like this and they took their fingers and they went, stop, stop, stop. And, they, and I said, what are you doing? And, they, and then I realized that they were counting the numbers of Snapples in the commercial. If it was five, they would approve the campaign. <laughs> the, the, the commercial. <laughs> Anything like they just Not good enough. Yeah, because they understood that it was about branding. They were smart enough to understand. Still, Richard says the success of the Snapple Lady campaign earned them the founders' trust to branch out and pioneer other unconventional approaches to marketing. We definitely did take risks. And at the time... We did things that other agencies wouldn't have done and other brands wouldn't have done. We threw one of the first great Snapple reunion events in uh, Long Island where we had a huge event for Snapple loyalists to come and participate and meet Wendy. And we had an actual room set up 
of all artwork made from people with their Snapple bottles and caps. And people flew in from all over the country, even internationally, to be part of the Snapple community. It was an incredible time. And again, you have to understand this was pre-social. And the campaign really functioned as a social campaign in many ways. And the idea that people were really involved with the brand. Right. Yeah. And, you know, you talk about it as a joyful experience. And and you talk about having a conversation with Arnie in which he said, all right, we're going to need results. Otherwise, you're fired, which, again, standard operating procedures in the business. But from about 1992 to 1994, Snapple saw a 300% growth in sales. How did you and the clients feel about those pretty impressive numbers? Well, it was a joyful time for them. It was a joyful time for us. I mean, we were growing, we were adding to our team. We kept growing the agency and the work was really lauded as one of the the most breakthrough campaigns of the 90s. And so we really rode that wave. And what was really nice about all the founders was that they're very warm, everyone. They really did look at it as like family. And so I think the more we did, the more the success was, the more they trusted us. It was almost in a certain sense like a writer's room for a TV show. I mean, we'd sit around, we had great, you know, writers on the business and you know, writers like my dear friend Risa Mickenberg, who I have to say is one of the most talented, you know, writers I know. And we'd sit around and we'd all just come up with like new ideas for the brand. And I remember they were launching a new flavor, you know, Mango Madness. So instead of a commercial, we came back with the idea of it was one of the first guerrilla marketing ideas. We decided to stick our thousands and thousands of mangoes, you know, like how Chiquita Banana has little right, stickers. Right. So, and we did that on mangoes and it said now available in Snapple. <laughs> and so we brought that and, you know, and then it was our job to figure out how do we stick our mangoes and how do we get it into the field? All of the meetings were, isn't that great? And isn't that wonderful? And sure, we'll do it. And, you know, and, you know, the success breeds success. So it was a really fun time for us. There were so many things we did, you know, putting little Snapple messages under the Snapple cap. We always tried to get back to, you know, organic branding and a level of authenticity and have a a certain level of fun and inclusivity. And that was the what we did. It almost it harkens back to me. And and you mentioned that it felt like a writer's room. To me, it sounds almost like an improv troupe where the imperative is always yes. And you never say no. If an idea comes up, you throw out a yes and and just continue to play with it. And it does. It sounds it sounds playful. It sounds joyful and, and sounds like a writer's room that I would want to be a part of as a creative person. Well, thank you. That was really was like that. You nailed it. And I think what's interesting, though, you know, I've had these wonderful experiences with clients over the years where you start to work on a brand like Target, as an example, with the first fashion housewares campaign that we created. You, all of a sudden, you know, you do something really unusual and success breeds success. And then the clients trust you more and they say, sure, sure, sure. You want to do something different? That's great. You know, and so I'd say, you know, we always try to do something that is different. But at the same time, I always felt that it should be heavily branded. Do you know I'm saying? Because we didn't have Coke and Pepsi's budgets. And so we had to break through even more. With the revenue piling up, it was inevitable that Snapple would become a big business. Kirschenbaum and Bond's work on behalf of the brand kept it rooted in its small business heritage to the delight of its fans. But that kind of success draws all sorts of big business attention. In this case, not sporting a suit and tie, but an old-timey ascot and a wide-brimmed Quaker's hat. With a nourishing hot breakfast of Quaker oats with that wonderful oatmeal protein. Quaker Oats, which had also absorbed the Gatorade brand, snapped up Snapple for a cool $1.7 B billion, and in the process became the third largest non-alcoholic beverage producer in the world. Founders Lenny, Jaime, and Arnie got to ride off into the sunset as millionaires, and Richard Kirschenbaum says it was apparent from day one that the company's blue-collar roots rode off with them. I just think in my experience, this is my opinion, I just don't know if they really understood or really liked the brand that they bought, you know, or they wanted to change it, So, which is really hard when you're working on something. So, you know, Valley Stream, the, their Long Island operation was a place where consumers really knew that they were really from Long Island and it was a New York brand and they moved it to the headquarters there. And I remember the time I knew that they really wanted to massify the brand a little bit more was when, you know, we always thought of Snapple as a quirky brand. It was quirky. 
the labels were quirky. If we change the labels, consumers would say, you changed, they almost viewed Snapple as like my little baby Snapple. What did, you, what did you guys do to my little baby Snapple label? Right, they felt ownership of it. They felt ownership. Which is something that you want as a brander for your audience to feel ownership. That's right. So, you know, when they started to take some of the character out of the brand, you know, they said to us, I remember, you're not allowed to use the word quirky anymore. Don't refer to the brand as quirky. And so at that moment, I knew that, you know, change was afoot. Along with that edict, there shortly followed marching orders that were even more direct. After Howard Stern made some, let's call them, patently offensive remarks following the singer Selena's death in 1995, Snapple pulled its sponsorship of the show without warning, prompting a public feud with the shock jack. The relationship with Howard Stern was terminated, I think because of a lack of understanding about how Howard had really built the brand. And, and you know, you have to be grateful to people when in brand building, you know, who do things for you. You know, um, he started at one point, I think, calling the brand Crapple. And that was really when the brand, it went from, this is a brand I love to this is a brand I don't like anymore. Jane Cavalier notes that Quaker also retooled Snapple's retail strategy, leveraging its clout to try and strong arm Gatorade products into the cold display cases and end caps that used to belong to Snapple. They looked at their Gatorade business and they wanted to sell it like Gatorade, distribute it like Gatorade, produce it like Gatorade. It started coming out in plastic. I remember when I first saw that, I was like, oh boy, Lenny, Jaime, and Arnie are gonna turn in their graves, right? Wide mouth bottle, the whole Snapple experience, they diluted it. And it just became, like anybody can make an iced tea. It sort of became an iced tea. It really lost the essence of the brand and of the product. And they were killing the business. But lastly, and I'm going to say most damningly, Quaker fired Wendy Kaufman shortly after its Snapple acquisition, declaring their intent to take the brand in a new direction. I mean, they spoke to me about it, which I thought was a little odd, you know. She was to New York. I mean, it's like everything you always hear about in TV sitcoms. And so in the end, the numbers speak for themselves. Whether the Snapple lady got the ax because she didn't fit some executive's idea of what a spokesperson should look like, or they worried that she was getting too big for her britches, the fact of the matter is this. Quaker bought Snapple for $1.7 billion in 1994 and yanked the reins hard. Three years later, Hemorrhaging revenue and firing their own corporate chairman, Quaker sold Snapple for a paltry $300 million, a $1.4 B billion dollar loss. That is an expensive lesson in branding identity. They thought Snapple was becoming a mature beverage brand, that it was becoming a big business. And now we're gonna probably, you know, we don't want this kind of boutique advertising approach, right? Create a boutique approach anymore. They want to get more mainstream Madison Avenue, what I call blanding advertising. And they probably tested it. This is always the curse. If you want to have a really bland campaign, test it. And they'll let the testing tell you what works. I could hear it. This is where the business is today. We need to evolve the campaign to you know, really fight Coke. And so now they adopt the same kind of marketing tactics and strategies that Coke and Pepsi used to win. And now you're using the same ones, you're, you're gonna lose. Right, you're gonna wander in as the lightweight and try to fight them at the game that they invented? Right, stay as the David, don't try to be a wannabe Goliath. I think it's a great lesson in if you're going to purchase a brand or if you're going to create a brand, authenticity and integrity is everything. I I mean, it was definitely a eye-opening experience for me as a young entrepreneur to see new owners come in and treat the brand differently, which was their choice. I mean, certainly it's their choice to do that. And I think at the time, you know, the management thought they were probably doing the right thing. You know, we'd make this a more mass brand, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that Consumers adopt brands for a reason and they love brands for a reason. And so, you know, there are always brand cycles. You have to understand who your consumer is and the loyalty that they have to those brands. And when they start to see changes in brands, you know, they may not like it. You know, I use migration strategy a lot now in my discussion with clients because what Swap by Kirschenbaum does is we invent brands with clients or we reinvent brands with clients. And when you're reinventing a brand with a client, I think it's always important to have what I call a migration strategy. You don't want to stun consumers or have them think that the consumer brand that they love has been changed so much they don't recognize it anymore. And so we try to take them along the journey and do that in an interesting way. I mean, I think Snapple is an American success story. It showed me that 
you can, if you through hard work and vision and never stopping trying, you can create a great American brand and see it become a universal beloved brand. And, and so it was really an honor for me to work on the brand and get to know the original founders. I thought they were amazing men. And you know what? They were very generous in spirit. So, you know, I think Snapple is the best of America, really, and made from the best stuff on earth. Both the Snapple brand and the slogan endure to this day. The brand has had its ups and downs, reunited and then again parted ways with Wendy Kaufman, the Snapple lady, and changed owners a few more times. Currently, it lives under the Keurig Dr. Pepper corporate umbrella, which goes to prove that just because you can mash two brands into the same trademark doesn't mean that you should. And while it's safe to say that the brand has come a long way from unadulterated food products, it seems unlikely that it'll ever again be as ubiquitous or as endeared to its fans as it was during its mid-90s blue-collar heyday. We'll see about that. So that'll do it for this episode of Lead Balloon. Thanks to our guests, Richard Kirschenbaum and Jane Cavalier. Jane, by the way, has a new book out, The Enchanted Brand, and she'll tell us about it after the credits roll here, so stick around for that. Thanks as well to Henry DeVries, whose tale of public relations and corporate infidelity riveted listeners in episode 22 of this podcast. Henry made the introduction to Jane Cavalier, who, as he assured me, did in fact have a great story to share. This month on the Lead Balloon Comms Gripe Line, it's Abby, a fellow podcaster from Arizona, bringing the heat. Hey there, this is Abby Herman from The Content Experiment. One of my biggest marketing pet peeves is including the letters RE at the beginning of a subject line. The RE makes it look like someone is replying to an email that you sent when in reality, it's the first time they are emailing you. This is a tactic that business owners use to get you to open up the email and it feels super scammy and the first few times I saw it, I totally fell for it too. (laughs) My suggestion is just come up with an engaging subject line and you won't have to rely on questionable tactics that leave subscribers feeling duped because no one wants to get duped and your subscribers don't want that to be an interaction with you. Oh my God, Abby. Yes, absolutely. Nothing makes me want to establish business relations with a salesperson like them trying to trick me into engaging with them right off the bat. Does anyone have data? Has that tactic ever worked? Because I still get those emails, and I gotta figure it's working somewhere if people keep trying it, right? Abby Herman, as she mentioned, is the host of the Content Experiment podcast, where she's regularly dropping more great insights like that. And you can drop your gripe whatever's driving you nuts in the world of PR and marketing, get it off your chest. Leave me a message on the Lead Balloon Comms gripe line. The link is in the episode description. Don't forget to follow this show in your favorite podcast app, and thanks to everyone who voted for us in the Webby's contest. No, we didn't win. We'll get them next year, but it was actually an honor just to be nominated when you're a little guy like us. Lead Balloon is produced by PodCamp Media where we provide branded podcast production solutions for businesses. Our podcast studios are located in the heart of beautiful downtown Milwaukee, Wisconsin, but we work with brands all over North America. Check out our website, podcampmedia.com. Larry Kilgore III with some dialogue editing for this episode. Until the next time, folks, I'm... An eligible Snapple fan from Wisconsin. Dusty Weiss. So, uh, Jane, your book, The Enchanted Brand, came out in January. It's made some waves on the Amazon charts. Congrats on that. Tell us, what's The Enchanted Brand about, and what can people expect to learn in picking it up? Well, The Enchanted Brand presents a new paradigm in branding. What does that mean? We live in very different times, as we all know, but maybe, you know, I say it's a world in metamorphosis. And during this time, people are very unmoored, you know, investors are skittish, workers are restless, consumers are fickle. So human beings are like all over the place, incredibly disoriented. There's fake news. They don't know what to trust. There's shocking things happening every week. And there's, I wouldn't say death by a thousand cuts, but this is having a real effect on people. So I stepped back and I said, you know, people really need help. They need to feel empowered. They need to feel strengthened. They need to know if this is a volatile, complex, ambiguous world that they can't understand, that's okay. They can still get ahead. And I said, I said, who can give this message to people? 
brands. We have over a trillion dollars worth of brand messaging seeping into our minds every year. Imagine if that messaging was designed to empower people, not just sell them. You know, it's interesting how you frame that because I was talking to a a buddy over beers a couple of weeks ago, and he says to me, you know, I cannot imagine a worse time in history to be the CEO of a major brand right now, because all of these things that used to be separate from the world of business, race and politics and international global policy vis-a-vis Russia and Ukraine is just one interesting example. All these things used to be considered separate from business. And now as a CEO, as a member of the C-suite, you have to navigate all of these social and sociopolitical issues as well. And he says, I can't imagine a harder time to be a CEO. And I look at him and I say, yeah, but I can't imagine a better time to be a human being. I mean, listen, it's a hard time to be a CEO because you can't pull off like Jack Welch's management 101 playbook and use it to win. You have to write your own playbook. That's what's so hard for CEOs. Everybody's going to have to create their own. And you're going to have to take bits and pieces and make choices about what you think is going to work. I wrote The Enchanted Brand so I could like give you, here's your brand piece. Your brand is here to serve your investors, your customers, your workforce, and the public. It's separate from your business. And I I advocate people separate it from the business. The business is going to make mistakes. The business is going to have unpopular points of views. So you should create a brand that everybody loves, can trust, and believe in that will help mitigate the downside risks of the business and amplify the upside. Obviously, you don't want to give away too much about the uh, book, but what's the best takeaway lesson? What's something that somebody could read that's going to surprise them when they pick up the Enchanted brand? It's attainable, and it's part of how you can help build a better world. Don't think about brands as a way just to sell your products. Mass consumerism, as we once knew it, is dead. And that's why we shouldn't be using the same marketing strategies and branding strategies that we used in mass consumerism time. People are making different kinds of decisions. And a lot of this also was fostered during the pandemic when people had so much time to think. They thought about things they never thought about before. And they emerged with an empowered sense of, I'm going to do things my way. You know, people are switching jobs, mass resignation. People are switching brands, companies, products. I think physical consumption, I think people are buying less. Minimalism is way on the rise. Less is more in my life. And there's a much more of a focus on relationships and experience versus the acquisition of material items. Jane Cavalier, The Enchanted Brand is available now on Amazon, also at Barnes & Noble, among other fine booksellers. Jane Cavalier is the founder and CEO of Brightmark Consulting in Westport, Connecticut. Thank you, Jane, for joining us on the Lead Balloon Podcast. Thank you, Dusty. It's been a pleasure.